Cold Water, Session 3, Part 2. Going to look now at float valves. At the end of this part of the session, I want you all to be able to identify where to isolate float valves before maintenance, describe causes of noise and how to rectify them, and describe some of the main basic maintenance requirements for Part 1, 2, 3, and 4 float valves. I also would like you to be able to tell me the names of um, the Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, and 4 float valves and be able to identify them visually. So introduction to float valve maintenance. Uh, water level in the systems are generally controlled by float operated valves, certainly in domestic properties. And as discussed in the module uh, previously, all, all sort of float valves should comply to BS1212. There's four parts to BS1212, part one, part two, part three, and part four, and each of them describe a type of float operated valve which we, we're going to look at now essentially uh, and it kind of goes from oldest to newest with part one being the oldest and part four being the most modern valve. So some general maintenance information if the installation has been installed correctly it should have a means of isolation immediately before the float operated valve we should always whenever we fit a float operated valve we should fit a means of isolation before it to ensure that we can maintain it in the future. Um, and you can get sort of float valve repair kits from pretty much any decent DIY store uh, and it'll have a few different bits bits in there which you could use to help you to, to maintain your valves essentially. So make sure you get the right kit for the valve that you're working on. Um, so take a good tip is just take the part with you to the store. You can then have a look and sort of compare. So some of the common faults could be noise, um, it could be a result of the pipe being unclipped near the float valve like we talked about previously, it could be grit in the valve orifice, again like we mentioned before, or interestingly it could be caused by waves as the water flows into a system, particularly a large system like a cold water storage system, sometimes it can cause the water to wave, go into waves, move up and down, and as the water moves up and down, the float valve will also move up and down. And given that the float valve, as the float valve moves up, it will push on the piston, which will close off the, the float valve. It, it, it will then shut off the water. And then as it falls, it will, the water will open again, which can cause sort of water hammer. Um, and it can also cause other sort of irritating noises. Um, so yeah, there's, there's ways you can rectify that. Um, and one of the ways is by fitting a silencer tube potentially that could sort of reduce the likelihood of the, the waves occurring in the first place or fit a different type of float valve. So uh, there is some of the faults, some other faults could be overflowing cisterns. Um, if the float valve is broken, for example, uh, it could cause the system, it could cause the water to consistently flow into the system, which can then cause it to overflow. So if you see the system is overflowing, there's a reasonable chance it will be as a result of the float valve failure of the float valve. Um, and you could either replace the float valve or, or just identify the fault with the float valve, for example, replace the washer or something and, uh, and fix it. There are other potential causes of this, um, one of which could be if there's been recent work on the system and someone's, for example, installed a blending valve but not put check valves on it, potentially you could have water being pushed back up into the system, into the system through the hot water system, which is uh, something that has happened before in the past. So yeah, it's worth being being aware that it's not the only cause of, of the system filling up and overflowing. Um, and another reason potentially the system could be uh, overflowing if, if it only overflows, for example, when the when the hot water system is is on, it could be a result of the water level being set a little bit too high, and then when the cylinder heats up and the water expands, the water then will will rise and the system expands out into the system. Um, and the water level in the system will rise and then start to overflow, you know. So there's there's a few different reasons that systems can overflow, but one of the reasons 
could be uh, a failure of the float valve. Okay. So yeah, essentially this is just the, the same stuff I've just chatted through just here. Ah, one I forgot to mention there. It potentially also could be caused by a leak in the cylinder coil. Uh, if you've got an open vented cylinder connected to your, to your system and an F and E system which is fitted higher than your cold water storage system, potentially what could happen is if there's a leak in the coil, the higher pressure water from, from the heating system, because it's this F and E's fitted higher, be slightly higher pressure will we'll sort of push in sorry out from the coil and and sort of up into the system which could then cause it the water level to rise and, and to overflow okay so we're going to look now at maintaining float valve so maintaining a part one float valve this is also known as a portsmouth type float valve and there's a few parts which can be maintained or replaced. You've got an orifice there which potentially could block up, so you might need to clear that out or replace it. And there's rubber washers here. This is the main washer which is likely to need to be replaced, and it's fitted inside the cistern. You can just push it out from the, from the piston and replace it with a new one. Okay. So this is all the key parts of it here. And we can see a good diagram of how it works here. So you've got your float arm there as your float arm rises, this sort of knobbly bit here uh, pushes on the piston, which pushes uh, the washer onto the orifice and that stops the water flowing. And the parts, part one float valve, worth noting the outlet's always at the bottom. Uh, it's known as a Portsmouth type and it's always going to be made out of brass. Our part two and part three float valves both essentially work the same way inside. They they have these sort of diaphragm washers inside there. But the key difference is um, the part two is always going to be made out of brass. Part three is always going to be made out of plastic. And all of our float valves that we're going to look at could either be side fill or bottom fill. Essentially depends where they where they're filled from, essentially, where the mains kind of water goes into them or where the cold water goes into them. Okay, so you can have a part three side fill one, which is a plastic float valve with a diaphragm washer inside. Its outlet's going to be at the top and it's going to be adjustable, whereas a part two is a diaphragm washer inside. It's made out of brass, the outlet's at the top, and it's adjustable. Um, and let's say both of these can either be side fill, so it connects into the side of a system, or they can be bottom filled, they go through the bottom of the system. Okay. And yeah, as we've mentioned, part two and three float valves work the same way inside. They've got a, they would have an orifice here um, and a diaphragm washer, uh, which a piston will push onto, to, uh, which pushes the diaphragm washer onto the orifice, which shuts off the water. Okay. Generally speaking, if they do start to pass water, it's most likely the diaphragm washer that's become damaged. Uh, they can be quite fragile, become fragile over time. Um, so yeah, essentially if they're connected to, depending on whether they're connected to high or low pressure, they might have a different sized orifice. So if, if you're sitting, for, for example, if you fit one of these in a, in a toilet um, that was connected to a an indirect cold water system with lower pressure, you'd, you'd fit one of these orifices with a bigger hole. It just allows more water through it more easily. But if you fitted it to a direct cold water system, which is fed from the mains, you'd use this orifice, which is much smaller hole and restricts the flow a bit more. Okay. Um, yeah, it's essentially it's one of the most common installation folks is fitting the wrong orifice because it can cause it to be either noisy or to fill up very slowly. And yeah, this, this essentially shows how a part two float valve works. It, sorry, this shows a part three float valve, this one, because it's made out of plastic. But essentially, they, they both work exactly the same way inside, so a part two and a part three, really. Uh, as the float arm rises, the arm pushes on the piston, piston pushes on, on the diaphragm washer, the diaphragm washer pushes onto the orifice and that shuts off the water. Um, but 
During operation after the float arm is fell, then the water can flow through here. It flows up at, through the outlet and out here. So I've looked very briefly now at a part four float valve. Part four float valve is also known as a Torbeck type float valve. And these are pretty uh, clever. These, um, the, the design, they, they have also have a diaphragm washer, but that that washer has a small hole in it, which actually allows water through onto the other side when it's open, uh, which means that you actually have equal pressures on both sides of the of the washer, which makes it much easier to, to switch it off. So instead of it sort of pushing against the full force of, of the water, you've actually got equal pressure water on the other side of it already, which means that the amount of force required to switch it off is significantly reduced. So you, the, the key difference that, that we can see with a part four or Torbeck type float valve, some people also know, call them equilibrium type float valves, is the fact that these have, they've got a small float because they don't need as much force to, to lift up the arm um, to, to force the float valve closed because they've got, the, they've got equilibrium, they've got a balanced pressures on each side of the diaphragm when it's open. And yeah, again, you can replace the washer inside these, and you can also have replace these restrictor uh, tubes. There's different sort of size restrictor tubes depending on whether it's going on to mains pressure or or lower pressure from from a, <clears throat> if it's fed from a system. Okay, it can be clogged with grit as well, um, so you could clear that out also. Often these are fitted with silencer tubes. They have to be collapsible silencer tubes, um, which and the good thing about these is they, they sort of reduce the noise in the system. And finally, um, after maintenance, always make sure that you reset everything back to its appropriate height, because like I said, if, if the system is feeding a hot water cylinder, if you set the water level too high, when the water, when that water heats up, it'll expand and it could potentially cause it to overflow. And you also need to make sure that in WCs, that you set it up to the six litre line. Um, and yeah, because that's the appropriate level to, to make the, the water rigs. Don't go past the six litre line. Maximum six litre flush we should have in a WC. Okie dokie. Now it's time for your task.